Good evening, I'm Peter Mayers. I'm a contributing editor with the online current affairs and culture magazine Inside Story. And it's my pleasure to be your MC and to welcome you this, to this evening's discussion about art and change in the city, precipitated by the phenomenon that is Melbourne now, the extraordinary expansive exhibition that is above us here at the MGV uh, Australia, over the road uh, in Hosier Lane, across the river at NGVI and in other parts of the city. This event is brought to you by Melbourne Conversations, the City of Melbourne's program of free public talks in collaboration with the NGV, the National Gall Gallery of Victoria, uh, and it's supported by future leaders and by Federation Square, long-term partners as far as the venue goes with Melbourne Conversations. And we've brought together five terrific speakers whose expertise will enable them to range across the terrain of art, architecture, design, urban planning and civic culture. So I'm anticipating a vigorous discussion about what Melbourne now signals about the current state of our metropolis and how it might change as we move towards a population of five million and beyond and see the urban consolidation that is planned and the redevelopments planned for places like Fisherman's Bend, Arden Macaulay, Richmond Station, Queen Victoria Market and so on. Now, a bit of audience participation. How many of you have already been to Melbourne now? Raise your hands. Yes, very good, impressive. Uh, for those of you who haven't, and indeed for those of you who have, uh, perhaps need a second take to see it all properly because it is so large and diverse, uh, Tony Elwood, the director of the National Gallery of Victoria, is going to give us an illustrated overview of the exhibition and tell us what he thinks it means for Melbourne. Uh, then I'll invite our other four panellists to join the conversation and I'll introduce them to you as they come on stage. And after we've chewed over the issues a bit here on the comfy chairs, I'll invite you to contribute. We'll have a couple of microphones for you. Uh, just one proviso, keep your contributions concise so everyone gets a go. Uh, Tony Elwood returned to the NGV in 2012 and I say returned because he was previously uh, the gallery's Deputy Director International Art from 2000 to 2007. In between then and now, he's been in Brisbane doing terrific things as director of the Queensland Art Gallery and GOMA, the Gallery of Modern Art. Uh, and back as director for less than 18 months, Tony and his team must have worked extremely hard, I think, to realise the ambition of Melbourne Now, a show which I think demonstrates not only the NGV's reinvigorated commitment to contemporary art, but also a deeper connection with the local, with Melbourne artists, designers, makers, architects. Please welcome Tony Elwood. Thank you, it's lovely to be here. Um, I'm going to give you a snapshot of what we have uh, in this exhibition and some of the thinking behind it. But I need to s start by saying that as someone said to me uh, um, about a month ago, this is an embarrassingly simple idea. And I said, well, yes, it is. It is very much about an exploration of the creativity of our city. That's where it all really started. And it came as an intuitive response from returning back to a city that I love that seemed to be just um, beaming with cultural pride, but in such... Um, I suppose, pocketed areas and wanting to actually bring that together and make a big statement about how the total mass of this creativity could be re-energised or, or viewed into, into future opportunities. The other key to this exhibition was this idea of collaboration and not just external collaboration. It was very important to us that we were also looking at what, would, what it would mean for an institution of our scale to work in a collaborative sense internally, which might sound a bit prosaic, but for us, that's what really helped create a lot of the magic and to do it within the time frame. And it's a testament to all the staff that really pulled together. But the external collaboration is what's taught us things for the future, to work with people like Fleur, to work with people who ex have expertise that we don't have and to admit that we don't have that was actually a big leap of faith for us and a really uh, heartening one as a great outcome from our perspective. The same when it comes to working with Art and different art and design. So if I look at the entrance statement that we have when you walk into the building, this wonderful architectural statement by Charles Bride Ryan is actually very much about an, a space of inclusiveness. It's about working with design in a new way uh, and it's about showing the community at its best. It's a flexible space. It can be, in this instance, a, a, a catwalk. It can also be, this morning, a venue for Japanese drummers. It's been used as a platform for great debates around the city and it had a petting zoo in there the other day. 
day. We have over 400 different activities scheduled in this one space alone inside the iconic water wall. That has to be a statement of, of, of uh, inclusiveness, if nothing else can be, but just one of many elements. Rory Hyde's uh, take on Roy Ground's geodesic zone dome, but done out of 1,000 IKEA rubbish bins, is also a wink to the future and a respectful nod to our architectural past. So architecture already is deeply embedded into that experience when you very first enter the space. It's also an opportunity to look at artists that we feel really deserved to be given great recognition and for whatever reason had slipped a little under the radar. So there's Peter Kennedy creating an 84 metre uh, neon work, which is actually a homage to uh, uh, the Higgs boson equation, so another great international story embedded also very much into Melbourne academia. So it's another Melbourne story and like so many things in this exhibition we've realised from this project stories that potentially wouldn't have been told in our city even though they were created in our city. Juan Ford, known for his, his uh, meticulous realist painting, which you see on the left, created this wonderful environment which is covered with thousands and thousands of stickers called In Flight, showing this, the, the, the magnitude of, of public participation and what it can create. Honouring our senior figures who so often get forgotten, you know, the thrill of the new. But there's Juan, Juan de Villa who's been making uh, magnificent works for such a long time and Brooke Andrew, an adopted son of Melbourne, creating a number of key acquisitions last year that we felt deserved a public airing. Sure, some of these works have been seen in the last 12 months in commercial or artist-run spaces, but it's not lost on us, the authority that we have as a public institution if we also bring it to such a broad public space. And I suppose we feel vindicated by that, by the 400,000 visitors that have now entered the exhibition. Here's Linda Maranon, a very quiet artist who works quietly away in this beautiful group of sculptural figures. Again, an artist that we had barely shown and we felt it was timely. Darren Sylvester, this idea of audience participation, but taken up as to the highest degree that we could possibly muster. And Darren developed this wonderful interactive dance floor. There's Mark Hilton, an artist who's been supported by the Buxton family for th over three years to create this exquisite and highly detailed sculptural piece, spelling out Don't Worry. That's another great tribute to a Melbourne story that we're able to hold. Destiny Deacon, you know, uh, able to talk about urban indigenous issues and again bring in a participatory element, which has been quite a powerful statement and again an artist being given the opportunity to develop her practice outside of the normal parameters. One of the most powerful statements that we've shared as, a, as colleagues when we've looked at the reviews around this exhibition have been the commentary around the fact that Australian artists, when given the right investment, start to have the same power and status as, a, as the international artists that we almost naturally invest in because they are international. We see it through our big biennales and major surveys. This has taught us that we need to, to apply the same set of rules to our local and Australian artists. This is John Nixon doing a, a wonderful interactive children's program up in a mezzanine at St Kilda Road. And of course, Patrick Pound's Museum of Air. This is also the gallery being a little bit irreverent and generous with its collection and opening it up to another artist to interpret some rather lofty paintings, but actually just looking at their air quality or there's some relationship to this notion of wind and air in general. And it's been one of the most, I think, talked about aspects of the, install of the exhibition. This installation, which is done by Muir Mendez Architects, has actually enabled us to look at the way that we present jewellery in a completely new way. It's a simple um, achievement, I suppose, but it's one we've never had before. So we're very proud of that as an outcome. This is Meredith Turnbull, who's looking at her sculptural practice and creating an interactive jewellery component, which has actually been seen all around the city as a result of that. So that sense of also the whole community participating in an art-based activity is something that we're seeing as a trend all around the world, and we're really uh, proud to be a part of that co conversation. When looking at the city, though, and trying to not just look in our own backyard, we did have to look at other disciplines that make Melbourne great. And jewellery is one of those international uh, uh, known uh, art forms that people talk about, as is architecture and as is contemporary dance. And so we wanted to look at various ways that we could do that. So working with Shelley Lassiker and a team of collaborators, we were able to work on a space where she had performed and the memory of that performance is recorded. This has a performative... Um, element mainly because it scares the hell out of people, which is kind of the idea. But getting Marco into the NGV was, a, was a, again, a big risk and a big leap of faith for us because there are, as you can imagine, a number of issues to deal with someone being blasted with this kind of light and sound experience. But I think he's come out of it very well. 
Anastasia Close, this almost performative piece where she has literally set up shop for four months at the NGV and talking about the commodification of the sector. So a slight political edge to how she's operating. The NGV garden, often called the greatest kept secret of Melbourne, which is about the worst thing you can say to the director of the NGV. I want it to be the most active garden in Melbourne. So I'm taking on all those city of Melbourne parks and gardens to try and outdo what you, whatever Rob's trying to do. And so we've got these wonderful sculptures by Caleb. We've got food trucks, a curated food program that we've done with Peter Rollins, a whole lot of wonderful activity based uh, things that urban commons have created, including looking at our indigenous garden, uh, looking at the idea of, of, of compost, of, of, of harvesting. It's been, a, I think, a real eye-opener for us in terms of that degree of um, landscape architecture as a, as, as a collaborative partner and that degree of impact we can have. A design residency in the Bolwell Edge Caravan, uh, which again is a great Melbourne story, the Bolwell Caravan, but actually having every week a different set of designers come in and actually you know, be there to talk to the general public if you've ever wanted to talk to a designer. And it's interesting how many hundreds of people have really relished that opportunity. NGV Australia, uh, again, the split of design and art was not, was not necessarily a, a conscious decision, but there seems to be more design emphasis over in this building than there is over in St Kilda Road. And Hotham Street Ladies are the sort of irreverent start to that experience. A great collaborative group of, of, of women who've uh, set, I think, a, a, a different tone for what it's like to enter an art institution by that use of the shared house aesthetic, as they say. Uh, Jan Senberg's actually positioning his collaborative installation inside our Indigenous galleries was also a big um, leap of, of faith for us in terms of the way in which we've engaged traditionally with, a, with an exclusive zone for Indigenous art. What was interesting here was also the first time that we'd actually put exclusively urban Indigenous art into one space. And that's been, I think, one of the most rewarding outcomes of this whole project because I think that aspect of the exhibition has held up particularly well and it's built very strong new relationships for us. Here's Marie Clark's installation, for example. This was Fleur's project, Sampling the City, which gives us an opportunity to really investigate the depth of practice that we have here in Melbourne and done in a range of very innovative ways, both dependent on new media as well as this uh, number of projects with specific firms who've taken the brief and interpreted it in their own unique style. Un Magazine, also looking at the, the, the publishing that exists in Melbourne, the boutique publishing that is actually one of our great strengths and again sometimes flies a little too under the radar. And their collaboration with artists is so central to what they do, so this is a chance to give that a much more public face. You get the quiet achievers like Peter Tyndall, who've now got this active blogging culture that we wanted to make sure people were more aware of. You've got this great Melbourne story here with David and Sonia talking about that the old age building is an empty space, a space that holds so many memories of, of our city and using it as a performative and interpretive space. And again, other architects engaging with our architecture, so sibling architecture architects creating a reading space but a multi-tiered space that also gave this new relationship to the river such a contested issue within our city and us actually wanting to help facilitate that debate rather than be defensive about it. Richard Lua with his great um, collaborative drawing that he's produced alongside someone like Nick who has this um, highly participatory practice that traditionally a state institution would find probably too risky to present, but we've actually relished the opportunity to have people throwing things at the wall, dare I say it. Jess Johnson, who has to work with a, a large team of collaborators to produce works of, of this scale, and yet we've been watching them occur in another number of other unrelated spaces and felt it's really time that as a state institution we showed the most ambitious version she could do as a way of heralding um, our pride in her being in our city. Douglas McManus, you know, a technician, an artist who works with fabric in a whole lot of new and innovative ways but hadn't been uh, really given much profile by us in the past. And then there's more conceptual projects like the Telepathy Project, which talk about the notions of sleep that are embedded in our collection, which we then have reenacted and then we will have our own official sleepover during White Night. Not that I think a lot of sleeping is going to go on, but the attempt to sleep will be a part of the aim. Julia Deville, probably one of the more discussed aspects of the exhibition, uh, an artist that we feel very passionately about, an artist who has to often um, deflect a lot of discussion around the intentions of her work, which when people discover what they are, they get, they get quite invested in what she really does do. Interestingly too, when we launched our nine day children's festival as a part of the exhibition, um, it was booked out almost straight away. So when it's actually interpreted, we found there's this very loyal and very passionate audience uh, in the family market 
Preston Zlai was talking about shoe production, you know, the wonderful um, smaller boutique industries that are occurring in this city where design, again, needs to be um, properly profiled from time to time. And wanting to ensure that we honoured some of the great known figures in our city, like Patricia Piccinini, with this great work that had only been seen in London before. And then the Slow Art Collective, who have the work that most people still can't find, which we don't mind because it encourages repeat visitation, but you can enter it through the Australian galleries or through a little known staircase on level three. But once you get there, it's this highly engaging and interactive space. Uh, Lucy Irvine, this, this idea of new, new forms of working with this idea of textiles or plastic textiles. Claire Ray, the performative in our current practice. This is actually hanging or suspending off our photography storage tracks. And of course, ARM Architecture, who are really getting us to consider the bigger issues about the city of the future. What a great privilege for us to be able to facilitate that kind of opportunity. And then also, again, more dance interactive programming as we go out throughout our season. We do actually complete the Melbourne Now experience with four late night Fridays. It's very rare for us to have both buildings open at the same time and to have that loaded with content, programming around the exhibition as well as live music experiences and that was only possible because of the City of Melbourne support so we're deeply grateful for that. We also had the public performance um, element with Ash Keating painting on our banner. In a way, the confidence and, 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 and joy in taking so many risks as an institution meant that everyone pushed themselves. So when someone said, I've always wanted to do an interactive banner, we said, well, this is the show to do it with. So we've really taken a lot on board and we've taken it on outside of our own footprint as well. Uh, we were delighted to get the support of Rob and the team at the City of Melbourne for the Flags for Melbourne project. This is a group of flags that Max Delaney really led as the, as the senior curator of contemporary art, uh, where a whole suite of flags are created for the Great Hall, really trying to, to, to rethink the way that this as a ceremonial space could be used and could be a celebratory space for this idea of flags and the history of flags in these large, um, uh, large baronial sort of halls, uh, but then taking that out onto the street. And having exchanges, this is one with the CFMEU, I think it is, with our Indigenous flags and the Union flag, looking at the politics of flags, what they mean on certain public spaces. It's been a, a very broad ranging project with a, a lot of people really committing a hell of a lot to pull it off, but I think it's been incredibly rewarding and a great way for us to think about public art and the way that public art can actually be conceived in a whole lot of simple but innovative ways. And there is Princess Hill Primary, one of the school that has one of the, the first founding designers of the Australian flag as a result of this exhibition, wanting to now have an annual flag competition and to continue to keep that tradition alive in the city. And also working with Hosea Lane, actually enabling the Hosea Lane, a group of all artists, actually street artists that identify with that collective to come together in a unique collaboration where they collectively redesigned uh, this during the opening weekend of Melbourne now. So one of the, the great tributes of, of, of creativity in Melbourne and the way that we all embrace uh, the differences that we, have, we find and having the NGV, I suppose, help to authorise that has been, um, I think, a very satisfying and one of many off-site components. In addition to that, we've had, for example, um, bike tours, which have taken people on tours of the city to talk about what inspires artists, both as public and private spaces. Um, that's something that's been, again, extremely well received and has taught us to think more externally into future, to future years. So for a project that was uh, a simple idea, we're very, very proud of the outcome. We're very proud of the many, many people, the hundreds of people who've helped to support it and, and to uh, enable it to be what has been a, ch a changing creative um, uh, component of this city in this year. Thank you. Thanks, Tony, if you want to grab a seat on the end. Thank you very much, Tony, and uh, an amazing to squeeze all that into 10 minutes. Uh, and I think showing the breadth and diversity and complexity of Melbourne now, but also the very large element of public engagement uh, with, with the exhibition. Uh, and I'm going to invite our other panellists now to come and join Tony in the comfy chairs, and I'm going to introduce them as they come up. Emily Floyd is uh, a leading Melbourne visual artist and uh, a major survey of her work is going to be at Heidi Museum in March, um, another survey of her work later in the year at the NGV. Uh, Emily works with print and sculpture, uh, and uh, you may have seen her public artworks along East Link uh, or at Docklands. Um, of course, she's involved in Melbourne now as well, and she's a lecturer at the School of Art and Design, Art Design and Architecture at Monash, 
and uh, on the board of Gertrude Contemporary Art in Fitzroy. Architect Ian McDougall is a founding director of ARM, ARM Architecture, the Melbourne firm behind such award-winning buildings as the Melbourne Recital Centre, Southbank Theatre, the redeveloped Hamer Hall, uh, and many other civic and commercial projects around Australia. Ian is a Life Fellow of the Royal Australian Institute of Architects, Adjunct Professor of Architecture at RMIT, and Professor of Architecture and Urban Design at Adelaide University. Fleur Watson is a curator and editor specialising in architecture and design. She's curator of the RMIT Design Hub and co-founder of the independent gallery and project space Pinup Architecture and Design. It's in Collingwood and Fleur has created and exhibited at many festivals including the Venice Architecture Biennale and she created sampling of the city, the architectural component of Melbourne now as a guest curator. And Professor Rob Adams AM is an architect and urban designer director of city design at the City of Melbourne. Over almost three decades now, Rob has had a profound impact on our city, leading the team that has revitalised the CBD and its environs, uh, from big picture projects like Postcode 3000 and Birung Ma to the fine detail of paving, street furniture, lighting and so on, helping to transform Melbourne from a place where people came to work and shop to a place where people live and want to be. So please join me in making them welcome. <laughs> okay, um, and I'm going to invite each of the panellists now to respond in turn to Tony and to Melbourne Now and to say something about what they think Melbourne Now means, signifies for the City of Melbourne and perhaps for the future of Melbourne. So we'll just work across. Emily. Um, well, first I'd like to acknowledge the incredible critical success of Melbourne now um, and to say that it does give, from the position of artists, it does give us incredible hope for the future that uh, artworks will be able to be achieved which have a new scale of ambition and audience participation. So it really does herald a new era, I think. Um, also, the idea of the confluence of architecture, design and art is something that we're very influenced by at the level of the university and something that we are attempting to foster. Um, also, I think it's amazing that all the artists were happy after the opening of <laughs> Melbourne Now. I don't know how it was achieved, but I think in a way it's this sense of the multitude, the sense of everyone coming together to uh, become a different form of community and to step up. Um, so I think there is something very exciting about this transition from a more kind of private understanding of contemporary art to this really public sense of art and what it can achieve in terms of collective action and public dialogue. I also think there are incredible challenges from the point of view of artists as we make this transition. Uh, I think that artworks that exist in the public sphere don't always translate to the private spheres of display and private fetish. So we need to look at how these artworks are funded that are so ambitious and only have a utility in the public realm. Um, so this is a shift that's going to need to occur and I don't want to see uh, institutions and public um, museums become like clouds where artworks are kind of uploaded for free. So artists need to be acknowledged and supported in that way. Also I think in terms of Melbourne as a metropolis, as a creative city, uh, we're going to need to look at how we keep artists in the inner city. It's an incredible uh, challenge. We're moving out and out and out. I'm in Preston now and I want to stop at the Ring Road. I don't want to keep going out. Um, what happens when we regenerate these areas, we think laterally about them, uh, we're caretakers of these kind of underutilised assets, as they're sometimes called. What happens when we don't want to move on? Uh, how can we stay in these areas? Uh, so these are, these are the challenges. And it's been done so well in this exhibition to have this sense of inclusion, of bringing political uh, debates and histories 
that are previously under acknowledged into the fore, but that I think is a continuing challenge. It's a real question there, isn't it, about how artists do themselves out of accommodation by revitalising neglected areas and the prices go up and then they have to move further afield. But there's also a question, I suppose, about getting art out of the centre and to the rest of mm. Melbourne that perhaps isn't so well represented in, in and we might come back to that. But let, yeah. let me uh, move on to, to Ian and, and Ian McDougall from ARM um, Archite AR Architecture. Thank you. Um, I must say, when, uh, when I did a tour, and having done now a couple of tours of, of the shows, it just it is kind of everything that you knew that was happening in Melbourne. It's, a, it's a, such a blitz of cult, cultural activity, um, and yet it's never been um, put on in such an exposure uh, as this has been. And it's, uh, there are a couple of things that come out of it and a couple of questions that raised. It was thank you to the gallery for including architecture because for a long time architecture has been considered to be a commercial activity rather than uh, its some um, true core, which is in the arts. And therefore, that's forever grateful. And we are sometimes wonder, why did it take so long to get the arts, uh, arts and architecture re-recognised together? I think the other thing that it uh, made us think about was a city's uh, responsibility um, to sponsor, to foster, to generate uh, um, arts, cross-fertilisation between the arts and the arts generally. If you look at any... Um, uh, revitalization of a city in New York in the mid 60s was really uh, driven uh, the city was broke you know like Detroit and out of it came Fluxus and a whole lot of um, artists working within Manhattan in shared facilities with shared arts facilitated by the city this is a kind of an amazing story of what happened there um, and so it just brings very strongly to bear the responsibility of the city of everyone in the city to make sure that the arts is given the opportunity to be seen, to create works. And I think, Tony, you mentioned this, a number of artists who might have slipped under the radar. This opportunity to actually um, show the work um, in contemporary dance, um, in jewellery, in all of those areas where it comes it together into one umbrella where people can see it is really an important um, thing about what this exhibition has done. And I think that's really something I, I want to pick up on later, which is about ha how cities make themselves into these cultural places. Mm. Well, that is, I think, definitely something we want to talk about, whether what comes first is that you have a great city and that encourages a chicken and egg sort of thing. That encourages a creative environment, a kind of ecosystem that encourages the arts, or do the arts help make the city, or is it a kind of feedback loop or, or whatever? But Fleur, let's uh, hear from you. Well, I, I wanted to pick up on something that Tony said, which was about this exhibition being an opportunity to explore. And I think that for us um, on the project Sampling the City was, was very much a starting point. It was a provocation. And we thought that it was really important to take a moment and reflect on that and to say, well, it's very easy to say Melbourne has a rich architectural culture. We can, we can see it in our built environment. But why is that? What makes it so? And I think what we really uh, wanted to get across was that architecture is a cultural pursuit. It's about ideas first. And that became a very important kind of driver of how we looked at what we thought were these kind of two, in some ways, opposing ideas. One was this very kind of strong um, positioning that comes into Melbourne architectural culture and, and I would say probably the creative community at, in general, but particularly in architecture, we we spotted that and, and in the exhibition we took some fairly broad frameworks to look at that but it was these, these strong positions that are really born out of um, not only the practice of architecture but not only building architecture but writing about architecture, uh, talking about architecture and teaching architecture. We felt that those things are very unique to Melbourne and then I guess this other duality that exists is amongst that kind of passion, sometimes anger, sometimes, um, you know, real strong debate, there's also this incredible culture of generosity. And that generosity seemed the absolute underlink that tied such a strong culture together, that really regardless of your position, regardless of your faction, that you were, I think Nigel Bertram was the one who, who said it in an interview that we did prior to, to the exhibition. He said, really, there's this this spirit of anyone who has a go 
we're, we're for you, you know. Um, that we don't, may not agree with you, but we'll support you. And I think that's quite unique in Melbourne and, and something that um, we need to reflect upon and work on how we continue to drive that forward. Okay, thanks, Flo. Rob, Rob Adams. I think I, I actually saw the exhibition uh, over two days in the sanity of January. And uh, maybe because it was January, um, all of the things that have been spoken about came through. But I left the exhibition and my wife and I reflected on how many children had been in the exhibition and how much they had loved it and how they had actually got involved in the different pieces. And their pieces weren't isolated somewhere, you know, in their gallery. They were amongst all the other pieces that would have excited other levels of audience. And I think uh, what Tony brings back to us and, and, and coming back to the gallery is this inclusiveness, but this inclusiveness for every level and not making art precious, but making it something that everybody can enjoy and feel part of. Why is that important? Uh, I think our culture still doesn't value creative people. We still have a culture that at schools will make children choose between a creative discipline and science or maths at a particular level in the school. And what's that, what that's saying is that, that that creative pursuit is not as important as possibly doing science and maths because you could get a better job. I remember my parents telling me when I had to choose between arts and biology. So I think we need to realize that you know, throughout our institutions and throughout exhibitions like this, we need to revalue our artists. And we've heard comments about them being pushed out of the city and that has happened. Uh, we, we know that they don't get given the money that they possibly deserve. The fact that an artist given money will get a return on that investment of 11, 11 to one, which is something we've actually discovered in the arts and culture part of our city whereas a road might get a one-on-one -on -one or a one-on-two. So there's a huge value that comes through this creative uh, um, community. And I think Tony's actually, with his team, managed to make that possible. And I walked away thinking, the next time a parent turns around to a youngster or a young child and says, we're going to the gallery, they'll say with excitement, yes, I want to go to the gallery. And I think that's a huge step forward for the city. More up, more up, fewer roads. I think there might be a few people I know who'd sign up for that. Okay, let's pick up on, on some of the themes. Um, underlying what you've all said, and everyone's very positive about Melbourne now, and, and I'm as well, but underlying is an assumption that these things, art, creativity, design, architecture, and be perhaps even good urban planning and design go together, they're somehow connected. But I want to interrogate that a bit. And what is the connection? Is, what's the evidence that these things are actually related? Because uh, I, you know, I know architects are creative people, but they're also design, they also need to do things that are very functional. Um, you know, how does contemporary art inform architecture or urban design or, or other types of design? But I I'd say um, I'm not sure about good urban design being a <laughs> that could be bad urban design might be a creator of great art actually. <laughs> um, I, there's a for me there's a shared uh, intellectual pursuit in architecture, design, and art, and the city is kind of a a field in which those those voices um, can be displayed. So I, I think that one of the reasons why Melbourne's architectural culture has been strong and if you think back to something like 1981 I think it was when there was a, um, a forum um, it was something like St Petersburg versus Tinseltown that's right and it was um, Sydney versus Melbourne and Melbourne looked like a pretty dowdy um, city and Sydney was all sparkly and it was all winning um, and out of that came a sense uh, of Melbourne's attempt to re think its position within the arts and it came out of the activities of people um, and uh, people who were already writing kind of hidden a bit who started to publish and you get um, through tension and um, art and text and you get a whole flowering of activity through the 80s which was really about people saying we're just as I said we're going to have a go and there was a facilitation by various areas to say we'll help you publish we'll help you work we'll help you put on performances so that cross-fertilisation between the design people who were kind of 
in many instances in the architectural area, are unemployable, and they just had to do uh, they just had to do stuff. So they invented stuff. So I, I'm not sure if it's actually about the form of the city and therefore urban form, or the intellectual vibe. It's the vibe, maybe, the between participating voices. Other. Tony, do you have a comment on this? Yeah, just, just, just pull that microphone towards you. Practical touch, examples yeah. of the exhibition is that they're all very solution driven. You know, you say to an architect who's never designed a case to hold, you know, 20 bits of disparate jewellery, you know, can you make this work? We've, we've not been able to do it. And you get the outcome that I think we, we achieved, which we're very proud of. That shows how, you know, working across forms, and, and, and there, there was an, uh, an architect very, who made a very thoughtful approach to the type of media that she would be working with and the certain use of folded metal was a homage to you know, a lot of the different um, practices that exist. Those sorts of things that are just simple outcomes but that require, again, this sort of intellectual marriage and commitment to, to outcomes and creative solutions is one example. Simone Leamon's design wall, where you have 500 objects floating up a wall in this building over here. Again, a great celebration of the various technical and sophisticated design th and actually quite a stunning around. installation in its own, exactly, own, exactly. own right. And, yeah. and, and so there's multi-layers of, of that as a statement about um, the way that we uh, depend on design from a functional and, and practical point of view, but also how when it's aestheticised can also have a very interesting role and an institutional role, which it hasn't had in this city for a very long time, I think is quite powerful. And, and I think everyone it can, can work together to actually, at your point about sort of civic generosity, People want to be able to support each other's creative pursuits, even if they're not necessarily uh, your own particular bent or, 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 or a fetish, as you say. Um, and I think that's something that an institution needs to filter and, and, and provide as, a, as an empty platform. I think hmm. it's also about a kind of invest, investment in risk. You know, yeah. I think um, really Melbourne has been a city which has shown that we're prepared to invest in risk. And mm -hmm. perhaps the challenge lies in that we're becoming more and more risk adverse. And this is what we need to do, is to allow practitioners to test their ideas. I mean, the ideas are first and, and the built outcome or the outcome is, is the end result of those ideas. So until we provide a set of conditions that allow those testing grounds to happen and that risk to happen, I mean, it would have been much easier to bring in an exhibition designer than to commission a young architect to do that jewellery exhibition potentially more cost effective, all of those kind of things. On a, on a small scale, it's about taking that risk and allowing that platform for those ideas to eventuate. And that's utterly important at all scales. Uh, this, is, this is an absolutely critical point, that in fact, we hope Melbourne now isn't the culmination of everything and from here we just go downhill. And it was the end of an era. Because in fact, that is actually what's happened. If um, Jeff Cobham, the great um, designer of, um, of um, sort of festival bars, let's call it that, um, says the, the worst person he has to deal with in establishing these amazing sort of um, events is the risk manager. And if you look at the way that um, the drop in um, commissions for uh, emerging architects, and maybe it's the same with people in public art, is the risk manager. And the person who goes through and said, oh, we can't do that, or we can't possibly do that. Um, it's, and that is a killer. And so younger architects are not getting any work, whereas 20 years ago, younger architects got a lot of work. They're now not getting any, they're, they're getting private commissions, no state commissions. And this is a killer on our city if that's going to be the thing that actually says from now on we must have all these people who say, you can't, I can't climb up that. You wouldn't build a 19th century building now because it's so very easy to climb up those. Can I just mention, that's, that's one element of risk. That's that sort of physical risk, the practical risk that can eventuate. And that is very common now in, in a bureaucratic world. But the other risk is just enabling people to take those creative leaps of faith and hope that people will be open to understanding what it means on a professional and personal level to actually enable that kind of opportunity. And, and it does mean, again, on a professional point of view, many people are very self-protective don't want to be criticised. If you don't want to be criticised, you don't invite 400 people into your institution. <laughs> and we decided we were prepared to, to be criticised. There'd been enough commentary about what the gallery does do right and doesn't do right. You really can't win and you have to get to a point to say, well, and I've got a very supportive team that uh, really backed me at the very start and said, you know, let's just put it out there, back ourselves and, and hope that with goodwill and good process, people will say it was worth taking that risk. 
And the success or failure is still to be debated. And we were just saying before, you know, we're still really open to people coming in with, with serious critical commentary on, on why this did or didn't work in certain areas as well. But you have to be pretty bold. You have to have a big support base around you to be able to do that. Well, risk, of course, invites controversy as well, being attacked for spending public money on X or Y and why did they do that and it doesn't make sense and that sort of thing. And that brings us, I suppose, Emily, to your point about, about funding. I mean, if you look at a city like New York, it has this amazing thing called the Public Art Foundation that funds all sorts of public art installations, often temporary ones, that, uh, that occur for a certain period of time. And that kind of thing is quite difficult, isn't it, Emily, to, to achieve? Yeah, the, the I mean, if we want to go that just, extra sorry, just step... Just pull your microphone a touch closer, yeah. If we want to go that extra step and make projects that aspire to the, the um, level of something like Oliver Eliasson's weather project, which is completely has its purpose in the just, public just sphere. Just tell us a little bit about Oliver Eliasson's weather project, which is at the Tate in... Yeah, it was a project in the Tate Modern uh, Turbine Hall which is very much about uh, people coming in, lying down, experiencing a kind of phenomenon, being together as a community together. It has no utility as something you put on a wall or in a corporation, something that can later be put on a coffee table. This is a kind of new shift that we're going to have to see um, in terms of, of funding and in terms of uh, patrons actually looking at the greater good and the common good, I think. Another the one of his shift. projects was called Waterfall, which was a, um, a, an amazing installation of water pouring off the Brooklyn Bridge, I think it was, in, yeah. in New York. But again, a temporary. It's there for a while now. H how do we go about then the challenge of funding that, Rob? Well, I think it's interesting because when you, when you bring these different creative disciplines together and, and uh, sitting on the edge of that, you've got urban planning. And you say, well, yes, we can see the traditional relationship between, you know, art and creativity in the public realm. Uh, there's another element to it. Uh, and this city is going through uh, a complete uh, change at the moment, uh, an enormous amount of building going on. In many of the cities around the world, uh, there is a return of public good that comes through development. And when we first started, or I first started in the 1980s, that was the situation in Melbourne. Developers got a particular amount of development, one in six was their plot ratio, and if they wanted to go to one in 12, they had to give back to the community, be it in through block arcades, art, paving, whatever. We are sitting on a force at the moment that is actually seeing development given away at quadruple the value that the planning scheme may say, with no public benefit coming back. And it's because there's an Australian culture, I think, and I, I speak as an Australian now, that says, you know, development is as of right. But it's not. And we could actually have a situation where if someone wants to go past what's in the planning scheme, and I, I saw five proposals today, every one of them going past what was in the planning scheme. That's fine, but is there a space for artists? Is there a contribution to a fund? Is there something that's coming back to the community that recognizes that maybe there's something good about this development, it might have something good about it, but it is actually providing something back. So we are missing an opportunity at the moment as the city develops to create the funds that have been created around the world for you know, not only the creative disciplines, but you know, preservation and whatever ever else we think is a public benefit. Affordable housing, might affordable be housing. Um, you know, great to bring back a population to Melbourne, and uh, you know, we were very proud of doing that. But we pushed out a population at the same time, and we only realised that too late to start putting in place the mechanism. So I think there's a shift that this exhibition starts to shine a light on, mm. and the reason all those disciplines are sitting in the same institutions is that they are linked. Planning and urban design can actually be the way that you actually create the resource for creative people, while being, you know, part of the, you know, resource themselves. Other responses on this topic, or? Well, I, I guess there's two kind of separate issues to respond to there. And just quickly go back to something Ian said, which was, if we're looking at 
a kind of shared intellectual pursuit. I think one of the things that worries me a little bit in terms of funding for art and then if, we, if we're talking about funding for exhibiting architecture and design or as a cultural pursuit is this split within the community. So often amongst the funding bodies themselves, they're still tr really trying to grapple with uh, architecture and design not being an industry pursuit or a commercial just, um, pursuit. So I think that's, that's concerning when it splits the funding bodies themselves in terms of where that money should be generated. I think we should be working as a, a kind of holistic cultural But, but I can imagine team. artists being horrified at the idea that some of their arts funding is going to go to architects. Well, and that, that's, that's the discussion that happens, which I think is really concerning and really worrying because obviously there's this small pool of money and I think artists quite rightly are very concerned about that, that um, moving into other areas. But really from a top-down approach, we need to look at architecture and design as a cultural endeavour. I think then, back to Rob, in terms of developments, we also need to look at fine grain development and making sure that we're embedding within our um, culture of developments that there is this commitment to fine grain, whether that's a diversity of housing type, whether that's schools and public libraries, whether it's um, other kind of cultural um, institutions or opportunities. Um, for social encounter. I think those two things are, are almost separate issues, but are, are about funding. I, I would agree that uh, art, artists, designers, architects can do amazing things together and that we'll take it to the next level. Um, I also really appreciate the categories. I, I'm not so into expanding the definition of art in this kind of, with this term expanded practice to include architecture, um, and design, I think you can get a bit of a, a kind of black hole in you terms of... I think you need to keep some boundaries. Yeah. yeah, well, I think also we find um, in teaching and learning that the students and the, the people we're working with are different. So architects are different to designers, to artists. They have different uh, human capacities. They have different interests. So designers are f do a lot more work they can produce things, they have a particular kind of discipline that perhaps our art students don't have all the time, but our students can really think of an idea and follow it through and generate a project in a way that we find the designers sometimes struggle with. So there are different capacities, and so I think that those uh, categories often exist for a reason, but that we can find this uh, this kind of beautiful grey area that we can really develop. And of course, you know, an architect can help you build something. Um, but obviously, I can't be an architect. I can't build a building. It would fall over. It, so yeah, there are I, practical <laughs> distinctions as I'll, well. I'll, I'll invite you to comment on this, Ian, because, I mean, we have things like the 1% for art or 0.5% for art and things like that where, you know, a major developer is committed or required to um, put a bit of money to a, to a public art project that outside the building or something like that. But I'm not sure that the architects are always happy to have public art because they think their building is the art. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no? no? Sometimes. No, no. Never no, absolutely happy to have, like, in 5% more, you know, like it should be the capacity to work with the artist working through. Usually, though, the amounts are mo modest on being, mm. um, you know, sort of underplaying it a little here. Yeah. Uh, and in many instances, the expectation is that it's a community project. And while the, com the community project might be a have a particular bent on it, it excludes uh, a whole range of artists. Um, and that's, I mean, it's kind of trying to do, in some instances, use the money for a social program rather than actually a commission a, a work that's going to stand or, or uh, a performance or whatever. If, um, I, I mean, I agree with Rob, and I think it's actually a much wider thing. Um, and it, and it does go to this core of seeing art as a kind of confection that we have, you know, after the main meal. Um, the local government is almost never commissioning younger architects. It can, and it should, and it should actually do it. It should, if you look at across the, the state, um, the capacity for local government to employ emerging architects and, and younger practices and, and even, um, you know, uh, middle-aged practices 
who are just not getting public work should be commissioned to do those works and given the scope to actually do it, not fee bidding. I mean, we're stuck in fee bidding. I won't get onto that, that's not <laughs> this. Um, and likewise, with the capacity to um, sponsor wider, like have facilities, um, the I, I know a little bit about the dance community and contemporary dance community in Melbourne. It's, it's flourishing because there are facilities that are sponsored by Melbourne City and by the state government and therefore you get a whole lot of, um, you know, like Lee Searle's piece in the, comes out of a really vital and small amount of money and you think so small, out of that comes all this. So I, I agree with Rob, every capacity you have to actually take some money from various facilities and seed it into the public benefit that art brings, I think has to be explored. A, there's a huge a return kind of on investment. Thing. Is what, yeah. And there's a huge return on investment is what you'd argue. Yeah, there is a huge. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at Morris Bellamy, who actually ran arts and culture when it was in my division. And, and he was the person who actually did the study that actually put a value on it. And if you take the small amount of money that's given to an artist and how they multiply that through oh. their connections and everything else, the return is something like 1 in 11. Uh, you don't get that cost benefit from much else in the world today. And my understanding of artist work is often too, like in a public commission, it's the last bit that goes to the artist's wages. Everything yeah. that goes on yeah. the engineering and the planning approval and the uh, risk analysis and, and the materials sure. and the fabrication sure. and so on. Yeah. I'd like to come back to something Fleur said about keeping them separate because while I can understand uh, you know, what you were saying there about it, my experience is being when you mix them up, you actually get some quite interesting results. And uh, you know, when we uh, you know, set about designing uh, CH2, uh, which was a building we designed not knowing quite what the end product would look like. We workshopped it for 10 days. And I, I made sure there were three artists in that workshop. And people said, why artists? They don't design you know, buildings. But in fact, it was the artists who asked all the embarrassing questions, like, why, why would you be doing this? And they set up a, a whole platform for creativity within that building. So I think uh, bringing those disciplines together and not having the differentiation between them um, is something that I, th I think there's not enough of, quite frankly. And I think it's interesting, if we start to do that, I think our funding authorities are starting to realise that as well. So we're actually starting to see a loosening up of a lot of those boundaries at the moment, but at a federal level we're seeing that. So that does enable us to be a lot more, to provide a lot, lot broader scope than we have in the past. Yeah. Mm. But the, the benefits are clear if you look at the difference between Melbourne's freeways and um, other freeways around the country, the, the um, East Link or um, Peninsula Link, the art programs that have gone with those are spectacular. Um, mm. but, I mean, I haven't seen anything like that in the world. Mm. Mm. And I think the reason they were successful too is like you say, there's often too many demands for these public projects. So you have to respond to the site, community engagement, look at all these different things. Whereas that project, they said, we want your work in our space. So it's more of the kind of Harry Seidler modernist approach, and I think that's that's a good thing. One of the things, just going back to what Rob said, I think is a real perhaps opportunity that we haven't really grabbed hold of as as much as we could is competitions for exactly those kind of purposes of where you can really get that exchange going, and particularly um, for public buildings, competitions have been really very rare. Um, and now we're starting to see a few more, but, but certainly not nearly as many as, as we should. So that's a real opportunity for speculative exchange between disciplines and, um, and really in, you know, embracing that risk again. But there's a funding issue there too, isn't there? Because, I mean, it takes a lot of work to enter a competition like that, and it's asking people to do an enormous amount of work without payment unless you have sort of some sort of structure to... Well, the best competition should pay for those initial in an invited realm. Um, and certainly in Europe, that's increasingly the case. I don't know if you would consider that um, true, Ian? I think competitions are a problem. Do you? I think the idea of if you take, if you're commissioning a work, you say, these five people, you go away and do something and I'll pay you to do it. I think the idea of big open competitions that go nowhere are, are a problem. And um, Sydney experienced it on the MCA. They ran a competition, it was won by Sajima, never went ahead. They ran it again, it was run by Salbrook and Hutton, it never went ahead. You know, this is just a, that's a scandal because it's used for, as a political stunt. But 
Okay, I'm, now I'm happy know, to discuss it. I know Tony's got to leave us, so any last comments from you, Tony? Thank you. Yes, I'd like to throw a, a bomb in the room if, and then Thank leave you. if that's yeah. all right. Good. No, that's good. <laughs> If you look at Melbourne now, one of the other premises around Melbourne now was to imagine what it would be like for our city to have a permanent piece of infrastructure, publicly funded, that would have this contemporary art and design emphasis 364 days of the year. If you think about the way that contemporary art is increasingly becoming the most popular art form, within the visual arts particularly, and the fact that this institution is very open to embracing a broader remit than that, what a shame that when Melbourne now closes, we have to bring so much of that space back to other collection areas that people have been missing as well. And we have to have a reduced experience like this going forward because we can't continue to pull down permanent collection spaces. This city really needs a third site for a major contemporary art space. <laughs> now I'm done. Okay. <laughs> I want to raise an issue um, with the, the panel now just before we take our first contribution, and that is around questions of, uh, I suppose, inequality uh, and, and justice, and what relationship, if any, art and design and architecture have with these, these things. Because if, if, you, if you map Melbourne in terms of where people live by income, if you map Melbourne in terms of where people live by their educational qualifications, if you map Melbourne in terms of where people live by the value of their houses, you will find incredible concentrations in the inner suburbs, within the area, say, reached by the tram network, the historic 19th century city, uh, and, and great disparities in other areas. And it, it seems to me if I had a criticism of Melbourne now is that it's Melbourne now within the tram network and that it doesn't reach out to, to the Melbourne that is growing so rapidly east, uh, well, actually, this east, but growing so rapidly west, northwest, southeast, and north. So I, I wonder what responses you have to that. Look, I, I think my response is um, Melbourne now then reflects, I, I suppose, what's happening in our city as we sit here today. That is the reality. There are two cities. Uh, there's a city that is well served by infrastructure, you know, with a whole lot of opportunities and opportunities to get there. And there's a second city, and, and you can see it if you want to Google, uh, you know, the vampire studies done by Griffiths University that look at vulnerability to mortgage prices and petrol prices. And you can see the whole ring of red suburbs around the edge that really, um, not that people haven't got good jobs and good incomes, but they, they're time poor because of their need to travel and the way they travel, mm. the distances they are from work and, and, and all the rest of that. And they'll so be very vulnerable and down to Very the vulnerable. Yeah. So I think one of the biggest challenges going forward for this metropolitan area and all Australian capital cities is to, to stop the proliferation of what is uh, creating an impoverished community um, on the back of uh, an idea that was a 1950s, 60s idea, uh, an idea that has now had its time and the profile of the people and our population demographic is going to see more people wanting to move into the city and those opportunities have to be provided. Uh, you could get me going for an hour on the cost <laughs> of infrastructure and all the rest of it, but this is, this is the fundamental uh, difficulty we have with our city today. I do think that it, this issue is something that artists are addressing independently. I know near me there's a collective of artists uh, that have overtaken an old uh, funeral parlour there was a fantastic project over the summer in West Heidelberg in a furniture factory with a group of artists off their own bat kind of getting together and doing a kind of mini biennale almost uh, out there. I've seen fantastic projects, you know, Caroline Springs in, the, in one of the housing estates. I think there are amazing um, opportunities. In terms of artists um, being increasingly pushed out, one of the problems is that when you're in the inner city, you're close together. And we even know this from the classroom at school. The closer the students are, if they're two to one desk, you get better work. So the problem is, as you go further out, you're farther away from one another. Well, there's actually a whole economic theory too around agglomeration economics about people being co-located, going back to Alfred Marshall in the 1890s and the synergies and uh, benefits that result from bringing people in contact with one yep. another. Uh, go on, you go for it. Uh, I was just going to say that one of the really heartening things that we discovered with the incubator room in sampling the city was 
that the emerging architects, some of them more emerging than others, seem to be really re-engaging with particularly middle ring suburbs and really making a difference to that typology um, and, and really using that as a site of experimentation for their architecture but also creating incredibly um, diverse and livable spaces in the middle ring suburbs. So as we were saying before, it's very hard for emerging architects to get local government work or to get those kind of commissions. So that's really where they're um, making a real difference to the quality of people's lives. And then I think we can see that research being really um, extended into the work that they're doing at MARTA um, in architecture and looking at affordability and different types of uh, housing typologies. So I think architecture's um, at the moment feeling quite hopeful in terms of, of really uh, contributing to that realm. Ian, do you want to? Just, just a quick one. I mean, I can remember there was a, a program in the 70s, I think it was, where regional galleries, Benalla and Warrnambool, and those sort of, there was a program to set them, build new facilities. And I think it's really, the, again, goes back to that capacity to show, to, com, to have um, uh, exposure of work and to, and in the case of performing arts, to actually just uh, practice and put on material, uh, develop material. So. I think uh, there is a bit of a lack of um, almost like infrastructure spending in the regional areas that would be more than welcome into those sort of areas, both from an educational point of view and from just people who are interested in theatre, in, um, in uh, visual arts, etc. But but the, the money is not thrown into those areas. It's seen as being all about jobs in road making or something. There are huge, of course, demands on, on, on the infrastructure, particularly in those growth corridors. But let's take our first uh, contribution from the audience. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, question to Rob Adams uh, as a colleague in local government. And I just wanted to tease out the valuable contribution you made about how to return that element of the public good in development and uh, in through, through new developments uh, or changes to existing developments. Uh, what do you see are the best tools for that? You, you, you can negotiate the outcome with the developer and that's great because if you don't negotiate and seek to impose it through a planning scheme you run the risk of VCAT saying that's not something that can be mandated. Uh, so do you work on uh, uh, Matthew Guy as a minister or whoever ends up being minister to, to strengthen that planning scheme or you do it more ad hoc in the way that uh, you, you can do it if you can get secure agreement. So what are, what are the tools? And can I just say that you've made, you, you yourself have contributed in a major ways to the public good and I often say that Melbourne's livability world's most, is more due to the efforts of local government, particularly Melbourne, to improve the public realm than, than any efforts of federal or state governments. But um, if you could tease out how we can um, ensure that in all developments as sure. against Okay, right, thank you. I, th I think there are a number of mechanisms. I mean, uh, I, I referred to the 1980s, and uh, at that stage, if you built in a central city, uh, you, you had a, a, an as-of-right capacity, and it turned out to be one in six, so six times the area of your site. Um, if you wanted to go past that, and many of the buildings did, you then had to, in fact, contribute back uh, a public benefit. And you could negotiate up to 1 in 12 uh, on a number of things. So I think it's got to be embedded in the planning scheme. And uh, I never thought I'd be arguing for plot ratios to come back because they're a bit of a blunt instrument in terms of the built form of a city. But the mechanism of being able to get something back as developers get an increased benefit is, is something we should do. The other thing we need to uh, have is we need to have some way of capturing the uplift. Uh, and I'll give you an example. When, when Fisherman's Bend uh, gets declared as an area that's going to go from, you know, semi-industrial to, um, you know, residential mixed use, there is an instant change on that announcement in value of property. And many times, many I mean, times, ma ma you know, huge change. And you could say, well, that's the good luck of the people who happen to own those properties. Um, and I believe in a bit of luck, but uh, four times or five times the luck, maybe not. So we need to start having a betterment levy attached to planning decisions that change the nature of development and where it occurs. And that's not uncommon. There's cities around the world that do that. Um, it's actually been discussed in this city to, uh, as we talk. So there's a possibility that betterment levies will start to come in 
um, in places like Fisherman's Bend and, and the growth areas around Melbourne. And it's, it's not like we haven't had them before either. I mean, the Sydney Harbour Bridge was built in part by levies on property owners on both sides of the bridge who stripped right. again, and the, and the uh, City Loop here City in Melbourne. City Loop had a, a, a levy. So uh, it's about just getting a bit of fairness back into the system um, so that, um, you know, we need to plan a city. It's going to grow in different places. Certainly property owners need to have a benefit in that. But uh, once you get a certain level of development, some of that needs to flow back to the public good. So I see betterment taxes coming in. Uh, I see planning schemes that actually say, you know, this is your as of right, but above that, it's a negotiation. And I think that takes place with the appropriate authority in that, in that area. It has to be a degree of transparency in there, I would have thought, too. There has the to be a degree of transparency. Is... It got removed on the basis that, the, you know, there were negotiations going on that could have in some way, you know, been corrupt. Uh, I don't think, uh, or I never witnessed that but it was used as a mechanism of getting rid of those. Okay. And, and now the developer gets the full benefit uh, without much going back. Can I, uh, do it, Ian, do you want to make comments, or anyone else want to make comments on this issue? Uh, did, maybe there's other mechanisms too, because what uh, the money comes in, it goes into a pool, and then you often get commissions from that, but there is also the capacity for studios, or, I mean, the uh, Angel Place um, uh, recital hall in Sydney was actually built as a requirement for the AMP tower. So actual venues or small performances or studios could be built as part of that as well. It doesn't have to yep. just be cash. Oh, I agree. Okay, um, next question. Thanks. Thank you, and good discussion, thank you. Um, in the spirit of having a go, what are we gonna do with Docklands? Because it gives you this extraordinary opportunity to do something now um, that is bringing in all these concepts that people are talking about. I've been involved with the Renew Australia stuff and congratulations to Melbourne and State Government for putting some money into, that, into the empty spaces and helping artists with having studio space because there is not enough studio space in Melbourne, <coughs> let me tell you. So I think it's an extraordinary opportunity and at the same time, I can see that if it does work, we're going to throw the, the artists out because it will be too expensive for them to be there anymore. We can have so, it for a while. Yes. But Just, couldn't we have, couldn't you know, we it's have allocated been flagged space? a lot to have artists in Docklands and it really hasn't happened enough. And often there's been offers of studios, but actually they're um, market rent. And it's, oh. it's just too much. So that brings up the point. Can mm. it be repurposed? Can it be reinvented and revitalised? Yeah, I'm surprised there aren't more studios there. But it is actually, studios are a fantastic idea and they have contributed so much. I mean, in Fitzroy, Gertrude Contemporary has done so much, but there's not enough of it. They could be, there could be a complex in every suburb. There could be complexes in these outer suburbs. Part of uh, the reinvigoration of the laneways, of course, was artist yeah. studios in the buildings above, yep. largely empty buildings at the time because of a glut of office space. And, and a lot of that because uh, down the centre of the city, you have a 40 metre height limit, which then, puts a value on that piece of real estate. It means many of those aren't redeveloped and therefore there's a low rental structure, means artists can stay in. So I, need, I think you know one of the things in Docklands and a lesson for the future is um, don't have this single value that goes across everything because what you get is a lot of the big stuff and none of the, the small stuff uh, mm -hmm. that is where the activity takes place. Mm -hmm. That said, I think um, there, there's hope for reinventing uh, within the framework of Docklands some of those smaller spaces. And, and uh, that's something we've taken on fairly consciously. Um, Renew Australia, as you say, is one idea. Um, but the ability to have dedicated artist spaces uh, and spaces where art artists can work, um, I think still exists there. Um, one of the benefits of Docklands, and some people might disagree with me, is there's a lot of space. So there's a lot of ability to fill back into that space. Um, and in that, a way, there's too much empty space, is what it, you're there saying, is. between it, buildings. And, a, a good yeah. cities get a proportion between you know, the built and the open. And, and you know, cities like Barcelona, I think you know, it's 60% mm -hmm. built, 40% open, and that's the roads and the parks. and that, that. Um, Docklands is a bit the other way around. You know, it's 60% open, 40% built. So that's leaving us with an opportunity. Uh, you know, what do we put back in between in those smaller spaces? And that's something we're actively working on at the moment. Maybe it's your third gallery for the NGV. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll just, uh, we have another question, unless there's uh, other responses? So? Okay. Yes, Maura. Um, 
I was just wondering if I could get a comment about the, um, the power of place and the importance of place in determining what happens. And, I, and, I'm, and to do the easy thing, I'll do a sort of a Sydney-Melbourne comparison. And uh, in the last six months, I was up in Sydney when they had the, the Fleet Review weekend. And uh, it, was a, you know, it was a fabulous event. S you know, Sydney was showing off beautifully. It was um, you know, a big-scale event, and, and it looked great. And it was you know, good on Sydney for that. But, then in comparison, if you think about Melbourne now, you know, it's very much, it is about, uh, I think, so, intrinsically smaller scale in some, to some extent, also about uh, collaborations between disciplines, but also, uh, because I ha you know, have had the benefit of being involved in arts funding over the years, you also see the continuity and, uh, you know, that, that some of the products which come from that is from the artists who have been on the scene here and, and, you know, for a long time. So you can remember someone who got a small grant way back when who's now... Yes, I do tell those stories, yeah. but, you know, yeah. so I, I think that... But I just think that um, different places, uh, the power of place, I think, is very... It makes a lot of difference in determining what happens, and, and, we, and that's an authentic thing. But I'd like to comment on that. Well, Flo, you want to...? Well, it's interesting because I think the, the question of place, again, for me, comes back to... Um, how you might look at, at this kind of culture that we have here, if I, if I speak about architecture and design in, in this context, which is, again, not only about the practice, building buildings or producing design, but about the writing and the teaching of it. And if I take an example, so I take someone like Peter Corrigan, I think there is such a kind of teaching legacy that, that comes out of not only Peter, but other, other teachers, practitioners and writers, who really uh, challenge us to think about what Melbourne, what Melbourne architecture might look like or what Melbourne architecture is and what it represents and the kind of ideas that are bodied within it. And I think the same can be said of the design discipline. So I think that connection to place comes out of not just the geographical place but the ideological place in terms of, of those kind of outputs of practice. And to what extent is that about creating a certain type of civic culture? I mean, as much as the physical location, as you say, but creating... A, a, and you talked before about generosity. Well, I mean, I think it's about this kind of um, layering that happens in the city. And I think, uh, again, it's about risk and uh, taking opportunity. So you have um, spaces in Melbourne that exist um, that are purely independent and have no funding whatsoever, their artist-run spaces or their community spaces or they're just simply individuals who've got together to create a space where, where this kind of discussion and um, practice can happen. And then it filters all the way up through, through this layering. And without that kind of cross-dialogue or without that support through the layers, I think perhaps, you know, we, we lose um, a sense of richness. About three or four years ago, there was an article in the um, Australian on um, Sydney um, was struggling as a design architectural culture, and um, the article was about why is Brisbane a really good design culture now? Because we all thought it was Hicksville up there, and uh, the journalist completely missed the point about Brisbane's culture. About 30 years ago, Brisbane had a number of architects, Rex Addison. Um, I can't th quickly think of the others, who decided that they would actually acknowledge their own cultural, their own history and their own uh, self-consciousness about their place. And they decided that they would actually firstly write a historical study of it, because there hadn't been any proper studies done. Um, they sponsored, supported younger architects coming up through and actually helped them get work. Um, the university at the time with Michael Kaniger and Britt Anderson um, actually were uh, self-conscious in commissioning both the local architects and the, the emerging architects generated a dialogue. And sure enough, 25 years later, you get a culture from the students of these people, um, the um, Donovan Hills and the uh, architectuses that do design the major buildings here. Amazing culture. They helped, they helped each other, are interested in their local culture, and that's what Melbourne does. Sydney hasn't done it architecturally, and so there's no emerging architectural practices, the large corporate firms have all cut each other's lunch. Um, I think it might be to do with the rum core, perhaps. <laughs> um, but uh, there, is, there is a substantial problem in that, and I imagine it's exactly the same in, in the performing arts and in visual arts, where if there's not a culture of, 
assistance and competitiveness, but um, that actually creates that place. And I think, I mean, your, your point about place is more about like cultural inheritance or um, rather than physical place, I assume, yeah. Um, I think also Melbourne now looks at the potential of place in terms of the first people of the South. And there is, I mean, I think a little bit of a re relative ignorance about these histories compared to other parts of Australia. So this to me is a real potential. You've got works by Brooke Andrew which look at genocide, Lorraine Col Colony Northey's work that looks at the idea of continuous settlement and projects that the NGV have done about William Barrack and the history of Corin Dirk. I think there's incredible potential there for a kind of um, a new, a new level of public knowledge about those histories. I think there's another thing that we need to acknowledge in Melbourne, and that's the participatory, participatory nature of our community. Uh, I know of no other city where people turn out in the numbers they turn out every time you put on an event or put on a show, or, you know, there is a, you know, here you are tonight. You know, I, I can remember when they discussed taking the Deacon elections into the Melbourne conversations and would people turn out? And, you know, month after month, you turn up. And I think that if you're in a creative culture and you're trying to actually have an expression, to have an audience is quite important. Uh, and to have an intelligent audience as well is even more important. And I think Melbourne gives its creative people that. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, I hope they got the joy out of Melbourne now that um, I got out of it because uh, it, it really was speaking to that wider audience and saying, you know, this is what we can do. This is, you know, who we are uh, and, and this is what we look like. Robert, and picking up on what Emily said, I reckon that comes out of the artists are kind of courageous in what they sure. do sure. and kind of go into areas where people go, wow, that's kind of a bit dangerous and a bit... Yep. and interesting and revealing in a way so, and it's um, and a lot of them and they all have different voices and somebody will be talking about it. Yeah. so it actually kind of comes out of the energy that's within the art but is, is there a bit of a tension here be, uh, because you know we there, is there a danger of art being kind of or art and design and architecture being kind of instrumentalized for a kind of brand Melbourne you know projecting Melbourne as this Create, um, cultural capital, this alternative to Sydney, when, when art surely also needs to be actually oppositional or critical, stand in a, a kind of critical uh, engagement with, with what's going on. I, and I think it does. You know, um, I'd hate to think that, you know, it's somehow being, you know, uh, you know homogenised, codified. I mean, I can think back to when people like Ash Keating were, you know, um, just emerging. And, and he, you know, we, we were actually doing the city square with the city water wall. And he appeared at night and started to actually spray a hoarding we had over it. And, and uh, the project manager was horrified and said, we must get it down. I said, actually, it looks quite good. Just leave it <laughs> and let's see what happens tomorrow night. And Ash came back, you know, maybe 10 nights in a row and, and filmed it. Um, and uh, he was pushing the boundaries because, I mean, that was, that was Potentially, well, it was illegal at the time. Um, you, you know, it now sits as an artwork in our collection. Um, you know, I think the artists are still pushing that. I certainly saw them pushing the parameters in Melbourne now. Emily, you wanted to? Um, well, I suppose to follow up on that, to say that uh, contemporary art is a mixed bag. So you, you have these kind of inevitable uh, compromises. Another one is the issue of entertainment art as entertainment. Because you've got but to get those crowds in, you've got to get those numbers through the door. You have to have that audience door. engagement, you have to you know, have the people through the door. But what I hope is that something is wrested away from that and that uh, the two, carnival and utopia, can exist and can coincide with those moments of contemplation and analysis and, um, you know, we have a little bit of everything. Carnival and utopia coexisting. <laughs> and contemplation. That's, I think that's a good place to finish. This has been a, a Melbourne Conversation event, part of the City of Melbourne's program of free public talks. So thank you to our event partners, Future Leaders, Federation Square and the NGV. Uh, thank you for your attendance and contributions and above all, thanks uh, to our contributors, Tony Elwood, who's now, now left us, uh, Emily Floyd, 
uh, Ian McDougall, Flo Watson, and Rob Adams. Thank you all very much.